Hey, welcome back, everybody. Of course, you know me. My name is Dr. Keith McNally. This is the Question Guy podcast. I want to get this right because names are really important. Alethea Felton. Yes, that's correct. Oh, I appreciate <laughs> that. So this is this story is going to dive deep into. Wow, let's go get started because I don't even know where to get started. This actually starts when you were born and no story. Well, all stories start when you were born, but your story literally starts when you're born. What happened? Well, when I was born into this world 42 years ago, I was jaundiced, very, very jaundiced. And my doctors discovered later on due to my jaundice that I had a defective liver. And it was nothing that my mom caused, nothing like that, but they couldn't pinpoint exactly what was wrong, but I had a really severe case of jaundice. So that's what happened when I was a baby and they found out later on that it was a chronic liver condition. So that's how it literally starts. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, So don't stop there. Okay. What's, what's all your, your upbringing and this is this doesn't start good so you <laughs> typically babies born like that aren't don't survive mm-hmm. so what's and going I on did. Oh, yeah, yeah so, well obviously mm-hmm. so i did i did obviously uh, survive you're not looking at my spirit i'm a real person <laughs> but uh what happened was um when i was a child i had stunted growth for a while i was a very very tiny petite kid and i had the most freakish growth spurt when I was approximately 13 years old, where I literally just grew like a tree, got stretch marks and everything. And I just got tall. But when I was a child growing up, I was always really tired, had a lot of aches, had a lot of pains. I vomited a lot as a kid. It was very hard to keep things down on my stomach. And my mom took me to my pediatrician and just kept saying something's not right, something's wrong, but they didn't take all of the proper tests that they needed to really get me where I needed to be. So life just moved on. I had a really great childhood, a wonderful uh, family life, household. Um, I have parents, I have a sister, lots of cousins, aunts and uncles. So I had a pretty great life overall. And when I got into my 20s, fast forward to my late 20s, I got really, really sick upon coming back from a missions trip. And when I got really sick, of of course, we thought maybe it was something in the water that it caused me to get sick. But me getting sick was really a blessing in disguise. Because when I flew back to the States, and at the time I was living in Washington, D.C., I went to um, Georgetown Hospital and um, I was flown into Georgetown. Wait a minute. Hold on. No. Backtrack. It's so extensive. Even okay. prior or prior to that. I'm sorry. Got back. I was really sick. I went to my first specialist, my first gastroenterologist. Okay. And what happened was when I got sick, she took all of these tests on me and thought maybe it was sarcoidosis, maybe lupus, was just doing a whole spectrum of these autoimmune illness tests. Come to find out, so this was probably in 2010, maybe, um, she ended up discovering ultimately that it appeared that I had ulcerative colitis and also autoimmune hepatitis type one. So with the autoimmune hep, is is it's when a person's liver fights itself Uh so you may have a healthy liver and it thinks that there's a foreign object and it's trying to fight it overexerts itself and it then sends the liver into liver failure Uh then with the ulcerative colitis that's part of the ibd or inflammatory bowel disease of family you have ulcerative colitis and you have crohn's and Ulcerative colitis is pretty much localized to the colon area, whereas Crohn's is the entire gastrointestinal tract. So at the time, I was having a huge flare in the colon intestines area, which is what led her to think it was ulcerative colitis. So here I have two things working in correlation. I have the autoimmune hep. 
I have the um, ulcerative colitis and it's all just making me really sick. And uh, I was put on different medications such as prednisone, other things to try to control the UC. And then what happened was um, fast forward a couple of years in 2012, I got so sick with the liver that I slipped into what was considered then end-stage liver failure, cirrhosis of the liver. There was nothing that doctors could do. I was told that um, I needed to start calling up close family and friends, telling them what was happening, and that talks of hospice were going to need to take place. But my doctor at the, the time, she was very much like a mother figure, auntie figure. Um, she's doctor? a black woman. Yeah. She was a black woman just like me. And she was big on um, teaching us about advocacy because it is factual that in the healthcare communities, these are stats that are proven is that black women specifically are the most overlooked population when it comes to healthcare. Because when we complain about aches or pains or sickness, most of the medical field overlooks our complaints and don't take them as serious. And mm -hmm. so she taught me a lot of healthcare advocacy, which is how I, I help, you know, people do that now. But anyway, she was like a mother figure, auntie figure. And she told me one-on-one, -on -one, she said, although medically I can't do anything else for you, she said, I really don't think God is through with his work in you. And she said, I don't know how this is going to turn out, but I just don't think this is the end of your story. And I remember her clear as day telling me that. And I was about to go in for my uh, final liver biopsy just to confirm what everything on the tests were actually telling her and all of my blood work, MRIs, everything was showing this end stage liver failure. So on the night of the, the night prior to the liver biopsy, I remember being in bed and I remember that my liver area, which is the upper right quadrant area, really started hurting very, very badly. And it felt as if somebody was just stabbing me constantly, constantly, constantly in that liver area. And I begged God to just take away the pain. So from about midnight to about 1230 in the morning, it was just this chronic pain. And then all of a sudden the, the pain stopped. So I was able to get some sleep. I had to be at the hospital really early that next morning. So when I went to the hospital to prep for the liver biopsy, um, did everything I was supposed to do for the prep. So then I am, it's not something that they keep you in the hospital for. So I was discharged. But on a Wednesday evening, I remember vividly on a Wednesday evening, my doctor called me and it was after hours, um, which was rare. She called me and said that all day prior, she had been on the phone with the hospital because they were asking her if they sent in if she sent the right patient in for the liver biopsy. And she was like, yes, what are you talking about? So they looked at my charts and, and what the outcome of that final liver biopsy showed did not match with all of my prior tests, even tests as early as a week before. A week before all of my tests showed end-stage liver failure. By the time of the liver biopsy came, it showed that I was no longer in that end-stage liver failure, but it looked as if a huge portion of my liver was healed. And it was totally inexplicable, totally inexplicable, baffling. Um, and she just said, this can be attributed with nothing but a miracle of God. Now, this is a true story, Dr. K, true story here. The autoimmune hepatitis that once existed in my body is no longer traceable. And autoimmune hep is not curable. And to this day, I'm not kidding you. It's not traceable in my body whatsoever. Now, fast forward some years, continued having a great life. Then something happened in 2017 and a lot happened even <laughs> prior to that but I'm trying to keep it with the gastrointestinal area. 
But in 2017, something happened where that's when I was transitioned over to the Georgetown University Hospital gastroenterology team and liver uh, team because I, I had come back from another missions trip, but this time I had to be rushed back because I started bleeding. And it was really strange why the bleeding started. Now, note this though. I had just buried a week prior one of my closest friends. I had helped to plan her funeral and everything. I had seen her um, transition from having colon cancer. And so she had passed away. So I was under a lot of stress. And with autoimmune illness, it is known that stress can be triggers for what are considered flare-ups. And so stress was a huge trigger. Then I had gone on a missions trip literally the day after her funeral. I was hustling and bustling in the missions field, just doing all this. And then I started bleeding about five, five days into the trip. And the trip was like a week. So they flew me back early. I called my doctor at the time, the same one from back in 2012. And she said to me, she said, what I want you to do, she said, I'm going to send you to Georgetown University Hospital because Georgetown had more state-of-the-art technology, unlike the hospital where she was working out of. And she wanted me to be and even the best care. And she was an excellent doctor. And for a doctor to be that humble, to say, I care about you as a person, as opposed to just me keeping up numbers meant a lot. So I transitioned to the Georgetown team where I ended up in the gastroenterology department. And in 2017, they discovered that I wasn't having an ulcerative colitis flare, but it was actually Crohn's disease because this time it was inflammation in the entire gastrointestinal tract. And I always had a feeling I had Crohn's based off of my mom's family history. And so when they had said it was Crohn's, I felt a bit of relief, but they also told me something else that I didn't know is that they also said that I had a condition that was called primary sclerosing cholangitis or PSC. What that is, is a very rare disease that is hardening of the bile ducts. And what that does is it eventually causes liver failure. But it could eventually cause um, liver failure to a point where I'll have to get a transplant. The statistics on that is that approximately 40% of people with PSC do have to have transplants about 60% don't. But the tricky part about PSC is that it can shift on you just like that, meaning it's a very slow progressing illness, but one, one day it can turn overnight and then you're being rushed and placed on transplant list. Dr. K, the miraculous thing about living with PSC is this, I was diagnosed with it now six years ago. They really don't know how long I actually had it. I have a liver transplant doctor, but I'm not on a liver transplant list. And that's because I'm not <laughs> sick enough to qualify for a transplant yet. So despite my liver going through certain things, the way that my lab work looks doesn't align with how I'm doing physically, if that makes sense. So physically, I'm really thriving in terms of how I look, how I feel. I don't have jaundice. I don't have ascites, which is fluid in the abdomen. I don't have itching skin. I don't have anything that, that the average liver patient would have. And I'm in different PSC groups on social media. And I don't take it lightly because people are really suffering with this. And many have had it less years than I have. Then there are some people in our group who are in their 70s who've had it 50 years and are doing okay. So with the Crohn's, that's controlled. Um, I have infusions every month. I take what's called Intibio, which is an infusion I have to have every four weeks. With the PSC, honestly, with the the liver problem, there's no medication for it um, that I'm on. And that's just by the grace of God that I'm thriving. 
And what I decided to just do is I could wallow in it and I could be down about it. And I'm not going to say that I didn't have those moments because part of my story, and it would take a long time, is that over the years, I had some close calls. I was in critical condition. One time the ICU was so filled up, I had to be put on a stroke unit once. I know what it's like to literally be on the cusp of life and death. I've had near death experiences, which is for a different episode altogether, where I've literally seen things in the supernatural that I know weren't a dream. And I was told not yet, and that I had to come back. Like that's how sick I've been in the past. And for the past uh, almost five years now, I have not had a hospitalization. I've been really healthy. I've been thriving. And, you know, I'm a wellness coach now. So, you know, just a lot of different things that have happened in my life. And I'm 42. So I've been dealing with health challenges literally ever since birth. And I'm doing pretty darn great. Of course, I have aches and pains at times and joints hurt and things hurt. I still live with autoimmune illness, but I think that my mindset and my outlook on life and just things I've experienced have helped me get to this place. And I don't want to give anybody the idea that every day is peaches and cream and joy and sunshine. No, I know what it's like to have hit rock bottom. I know what it's like to want to to just not wake up the next day. I know what it's like to be so depressed and so low and not know how in the world I'm gonna make it. And in the course of that time, since 2017, I lost both of my best friends, my closest friends on earth who had helped me on my sick bed. They ended up getting cancer, passed away. And I never saw that coming because they were healthy. So there have been a lot of challenges in my life, but I choose joy. I choose every day to enjoy my life. I choose to believe that the latter part of my life is going to be the best part. I was sick, young, latter part of my life. I'm thriving. That's just how I have to view it. And I don't fear death or anything like that, but I don't plan to leave earth anytime soon <laughs> and i know that was a mouthful <laughs> well it was a good thing it came out of your mouth because i couldn't have said all that <laughs> but i would like to backtrack just a bit because you said um given all of that you make choices you're mm -hmm. making choices to make the best effort to live each day making the most of it mm -hmm. how do you do that <laughs> Seriously, that's a real question. How do you do that waking up every day knowing that today something, literally, I'll, I'll just use the word bad, something bad could happen? Because that's a real choice. And people need mm -hmm. to, people in the audience would love to know, hell, I want to know. Okay. There are a couple of ways. First of all, I've always had a firm faith. I follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. And I say that, that I'm the, I, I'm a follower of Christ. I believe in Jesus as my savior, the, the divine nature, all of that. But I also believe that I share or, or we share as human beings, as God's creation, that we also share God's DNA. And what I mean by that is that I choose to have the God within me give me the strength and the power day by day to say, I'm going to shift my mindset into thinking on what could go right instead of what could go wrong. It didn't happen overnight. There's a quote I love and it says, don't judge my story based on the chapter you walked in on because this process of where I am now took work, it took effort, it took energy and it took practice. So my faith has helped me where I say, okay, each day that I have, I can either be sad and depressed every day of my life and let life pass me by, or I can choose to make the best of something going right. Even if it means that I can watch a good show on TV, that's something good that's happening. Even if it means that I can do something 
is silly and it makes myself laugh. I remember Dr. K, there was a summer, I want to say it was summer 2014, it had nothing to do with the Crohn's or the liver because I didn't share I was born with asthma <laughs> and I've battled double pneumonia twice that almost took me out. Uh, I had a severe asthma attack one time, almost killed me. No, twice, almost killed me due to a nasal polyp. I had a, a really weird stomach infection several years ago that had me in the hospital. So I'm focusing on the Crohn's and the liver, but it's been a lot. Practically, my heart is pretty, my heart and my re reproductive system are pretty much the only organs of mine that have been like strong <laughs> but in terms of lungs everything else no so I brought up 2014 because I remember there was a summer where I was on complete bed rest because I had had a severe asthma attack I had a walk with a cane I had to learn how to dress myself again. And my bedroom was literally set up like my sick room. And I remember crying at one point because it was a summer. I love summer. And I couldn't go anywhere. And I got so low where I was just like, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? And what a friend of mine did, that friend at the time texted me some pictures of them at a cookout and people I knew and basically all of these people at this cookout lined up for a group picture to personally send to me saying, we love you, we care, we're praying for you, we're hoping the best. And that right there made me say, you know what, life is worth living because I still have people that actually care, although I feel so alone. Mm -hmm. So my faith, a support system has helped me and I am compassionate with people that don't have one. I've come across people that don't have a support system where so many people are just so alone in this world. But I challenge a person in that situation to say, even if you can connect with one or two people through uh, different community groups, through online resources, somebody else who may be in a similar situation, you can create your own community. So my faith helped me, community helped me. And also it was just the, the power of believing in me. I didn't like how it felt to wallow in my thoughts. I didn't like how it felt to, to focus on the the like bad stuff inside and studies show 85 percent of a human being's thoughts are innately negative that's a fact so it is going to so we're pretty normal when we tend to default to the negative that's actually normal to do but it takes an extra amount of work i won't even say strength because even if a person thinks negatively it doesn't take away their strength we're human but it takes an extra amount of work where I chose to say, I'm going to focus on what I can control instead of worrying about what I can't. And through that process, I made a conscious choice in, 20, in 2017 after my friend passed away. I started to take therapy. I did grief counseling, but I also did personal therapy. And the personal therapy went way back into my childhood, into my life, and just really examined me. So having therapy helped me where I was going every week for a couple of years. Then it eased up to once a month. Then it became quarterly. And now with my therapist, fast forward six, almost seven years later, um, therapy now is as needed. I contact her when I need a check-in. So it was a multi-layered approach, but for some reason, Dr. K, as a person, I've, I've just always kind of had a kind of peppy disposition. Um, I've always kind of been the eternal optimist, not a toxic positive person. No, because with toxic positivity, you ignore the reality of stuff. And that's not me. I acknowledge the fact that life can friggin' suck. I acknowledge that, but what I choose to do is say, although there are aspects of life that suck, there's still good in it. Despite 
me having these liver issues, colon issues, whatever, I can still see. I can still talk. I can still move my hands. I remember being in a hospital where a nurse had to take care of everything for me, from helping me to go to the bathroom, to feeding, to walking. Like I know what it's like to be so incapacitated and not able to do anything that it caused me to just appreciate the little things more. And I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I want to live to be an old lady. One of my great grandmothers lived to be 104. I would love to live that long. But with my experiences, death does not scare me. But I'm not going to worry about when I'm going to die, if I'm going to die, if I'm going to have to have a transplant. Well, if we all are, but you know, when or, or, or how. What I can choose to do is take the best years of my life, whether I have a year left or I have 50 years left, and I'm going to choose to find a bit of sunshine, even in the midst of the rain and the clouds. But it took work and I couldn't do it alone. So it took me venting. It took me being angry. The type of relationship I have with God is I talk to God just like I talk to you. I don't go like, oh, thee, thine, father, hither. No, I don't do any of that. I'll tell him, this sucks. This is horrible. I can't stand the fact that I have this. What are you doing? Come on now. That's how I talk to God, always have. And so me even talking to my spiritual power, and I tell people all the time, if you don't believe in a God, cool, but you got to vent to something. If it's a table or a desk or a chair, you need to get it out, let it out somehow. You can't carry it alone. And that's the whole thing is that if I carried all of this myself, I would have lost my mind and never returned because I know what that mental health challenge is like in struggling with it. That's why I had to get help because it could easily have just gotten me so low where I didn't know which way I was going to turn. And that's why I'm, com I'm compassionate with people who take their lives or people who don't think there's any end in sight because life can hit us hard. It's hit and knocked me so many times, more times than I could count where I just said, no, I'm not gonna let this take me under. I'm gonna choose my best and teach people how to get to this place in this space as well. Well, that's going to be a conversation for another show because you're actually a wellness coach, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And so let's tease that for a little bit. How does how did you become you and <laughs> become a well a wellness coach? Because holistic this, wellness coach, uh, holistic yeah. wellness coach. Holistic. Uh -huh. Let's let's tease it and then bring you back. Okay, so I became a holistic health coach, wellness coach. I call myself wellness coach because I shifted more from just strictly a holistic health coach. This is how it happened. Go back to 2014 when I had just come out the hospital from being really sick. A former colleague had had called me just out of the blue. And I talked to her because I guess she saw a post that I made and said, girl, what's going on? And I told her and I said, you know, I said, I've had personal trainers. I've had this. I've had that. And please note, I want the audience to know, I want y'all to know, none of these conditions were caused by anything I ate or anything that I did. I've always been pretty active and I've always enjoyed eating healthy. Um, but anyway, she told me at the time, she said, well, you know, my husband is a health coach. And I said, girl, I forgot all about that. So um, she said, I'm going to connect you with him. So she connected me with her husband, shout out to James Tate, who was my first health coach. And uh, James actually, now this was the crazy part to me. And I've told him this since. James came to me when I was literally on my sick bed and he had all of his little binders and he had his little stuff for me. And he gave me my first health coaching session when I was literally discharged from the hospital on my sick bed when I was on bed rest and I couldn't walk and I couldn't move and I couldn't do anything. So he's going through telling me about holistic health, mind, body, spirit, and that um, 
it's just not physical fat that that we have to get rid of but we have to get rid of the mental emotional and spiritual fat and all of this stuff and I'm like what but it but it was intriguing so then once I got strong enough we met elsewhere and he was my health coach consistently for a few years and he connected me with my my um former personal trainer and I've moved from Washington DC a few months ago but my health coach James introduced me to my personal trainer Gabe and I started lifting I started working out all of that while still being coached so then finally I decided a few years later I said, I want to learn more about this holistic health, not at the time for clients, but for me to just learn about me as a person, body, holistic health tips, things of that nature. So I ended up enrolling at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, and I received my health coaching certification license. And so what it did to me was it got me to view food differently. It got me to view everything about me differently as a person. And what I noticed was it went beyond the plate because one person's food is another person's poison. Just because this person might be a vegan, veganism might not work for that person over there. So it wasn't a one size fits all approach. So I started incorporating different things in my life that could just alleviate certain symptoms. If I was having joint aches, okay, I knew what what types of foods I could incorporate or what types of exercises I could do to help with these symptoms. And James also, oh gosh, he would be a great guest of yours. James also had an incredible story, which got him into the health coaching world. And so that's how I ended up up shifting into this realm. And with the wellness thing, a lot of us eat truly evolve over the years who are in this field and we find things that align more to our philosophy so I also went and got a life coaching certification later on after the health coaching one and from there I started looking more into the wellness aspect because they go hand in hand so James's health coaching although a lot of it focused on foods and what to eat there was also you know, those spiritual practices, emotional practices, mental practices. And that's what transitioned me into the wellness. So on my own, independently, I've done some, you know, coursework and like wellness, well-being, the whole person, which is that holistic approach. And so in terms of that wellness aspect of it, I help people get to their next. What is stopping them to get to their next in life. And that next could be a person who simply wants to incorporate more time to exercise and don't have it. It could be a person that wants to have that courage to make that transition from this job to the next and don't know how. So that's what I do is that I have a gift and a niche for helping people discover what is that pain point or what is that blockage in their life keeping them stuck from transitioning into that next goal in their life. That's what I do as a wellness coach. Well, I appreciate all that. That was fantastic. And I didn't have to say too much. So <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> Alethea, you're coming yes. back for Coach's Corner, right? Because we're going to talk about I actually how that yeah. works. I definitely will. I definitely will. <sighs> okay. Yeah. With the amount of time that we have left, Mm -hmm. people have already been inspired. My life has already been changed. And so I'm good here. Mm -hmm. But you need to leave something with our audience to give them that spark to say, you know, if there's somebody on their sick bed, as you've called it, and Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you wanted to call it your deathbed because you've been there a couple of times too. (laughs) Yeah, I have more times than I'm like. (laughs) And that's really bad because when we're not feeling good, physically you know our whole life is down Mm -hmm. give them a word of encouragement please before we go please what i'd like to say to you directly whether you're on your sick bed your deathbed or maybe 
you're just going through a really tough time right now and it's just challenging in your life and you don't see your way out, I want you, number one, to know that I see you. I see you. I literally see you. And I also want to tell you that if you just don't see any end in sight, I challenge you, look at a clock that's near you or something that's close by. Look at the time that you have now. And I want you to say, I'm going to keep going for another 10 minutes. Then at that 10 minute increment, say, you know what? I think I can make it till that next hour. And then from there, you build on to say, I think I can make it to the next day. What I mean to tell you is take it one day at a time. What I want you to also do is do your best, even if it takes all of the strength that you have. Find one thing in your day that can bring a smile to your face or can bring you a little peace of mind. It could be something as simple as, say, if you can't move right now, but you can hear this. Maybe you can see something in the distance or you see something that's even something as small as your little favorite color. And that can bring a smile to your face. What I want you to just try to do is just know I want you to hold on. I want you to know that there is still something meant for you to do even if it doesn't feel that way right now. I want you to know that there is someone in this life who needs you and who does care about you, even if you don't recognize it. And I want you to know that, that your life is not by accident and that you have meaning. I don't know what that purpose is for you, but I do know that if you just go at it for another day, and try at it for another day, I'm telling you that something will change to make your perspective a bit better. How do I know? Because I've been there. I know what it's like to hit the very rock bottom of rock bottom and to think there's no way out. But I'm telling you, if you hold on, a change does come. There's no better way to end the conversation. Thank you so much for those of you who have been watching and listening. This has been another edition of the Question God podcast, and I'll see you next time. Take care.